And let's get to our panel. We have right next to me, Tan Sri Dato Sharil Stamsudin, President and Group CEO, Malaysia Sapura Kanchana Petroleum. And we have His Excellency Natik Aliyev, Azerbaijan's Minister of Energy. The Honorable, the, the Honorable Sudirman Said, Indonesia's Minister of Energy and Mineral Resources. Melody Boon Meyer, President, Chevron Asia Pacific Exploration and Production Company, Chevron Corporation, Singapore. <clears throat> Admiral Harry Harris, Commander of the U.S. Pacific Fleet of the U.S. Navy. So we have a very distinguished panel. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to kick off with this extreme price movement that's triggered so much debate, especially in recent times, about how genuine the recovery has been. Uh, so Charil, it's been really a fast-moving drama with so many stakeholders wondering where the price direction is. From where you sit, you're a fully-fledged uh, oil and gas uh, player. Do you, what will give you convincing signs that uh, this, genu this recovery is on an uptrend? Uh, thank you very much, and I'm honored to be here with such distinguished panelists. Uh, from, my, from my point of view, I think at, at the end of the day, we have to go back to basics, which is supply and demand. Hmm. And uh, we also have to come to terms that this is a cyclical industry where you will have prices go up and go down uh, over, over the long term. But, but the, um, I'd say the light at the end of the tunnel is that in the long term, we'll always see demand growing. And uh, I believe uh, within the next two to three years, we'll see price come to an optimum level. Uh, it is very clear that over the past 10 years, there's been a boom in the industry and uh, prices have gone up, hmm. uh, cost of extraction has gone up, and uh, this correction will force industry like ourselves to optimize and find new ways of extracting hydrocarbons at a more effective and efficient price. I think this is very important because if we put it in the context of the development of any region, uh, energy is a very important resource and a very important catalyst uh, to uh, propagate and catalyze uh, development of the area itself. Um, and uh, if we don't keep it down at an optimum level, then we would find uh, development of consumption, economic areas will be retarded. We also have the challenge of supply. Yeah. Yeah? We will see growth coming from the Asia, uh, greater Asia region to about 80% of global growth. And we will see Asia becoming a net importer in the next decade or so. So it's even more important that this area utilize its investment in developing this resource in the most effective way. Mm. Um, it is a big base of population here. If this population in this ASEAN region or Asian region uh, progresses, it, it will then uh, generate consumption and the needs for goods and services that would come from other areas. So since we are in an interconnected uh, environment ecosystem, uh, there is a need to make sure that there is security, uh, there is investment coming into this area over the long term to ensure the development of the area itself. Mm. So when I first uh, looked at the title geopolitics, I asked myself, what's the end of it? You know, what's geopolitics for? What is the outcome? I guess, uh, what, why do we have geopolitics? Why does it exist? Uh, I think that's the question we need to ask ourselves today maybe. Absolutely. Is it to develop a, an ecosystem that is self-perpetuating and even across, or are we uh, arguing for islands of prosperity in different regions? Right. So I guess that's I mean, my opening statement. Overall, everybody is saying that we're ultimately in a long-term uptrend. But if you take a look at what the oil majors are, are, are doing, we'll get uh, a Melody to comment in just a little bit. In the end, uh, it seems like maybe it might not be so the, the case because we have uh, more supply evidently coming onto the market. So from where you sit, uh, just along the Caspian Sea, Minister Aliyev, uh, the recent oil route, ha it certainly dented your state finances. But do you, as a host country, are you still uh, stepping up CapEx in investment? Thank you so much. First of all, I would like to say that I'm very pleased to be here in Jakarta in such significant event like the World Economic Forum. And uh, I came from Azerbaijan, like you say, it's country on the west side of the Caspian Sea. And uh, 
if we speak about the geopolitics, I would like to say that now the energy is the main factor, you know, of stability, development of each country. And uh, if we just to, would like to develop uh, our economy, we uh, have to uh, secure uh, our energy supply, demand, uh, diversification, diversification routes, you know, and so on. That is why um, I think that uh, in our country, in Azerbaijan, when we start our uh, new strategy, uh, new oil strategy, you know, we um, increase uh, our production uh, last 20 years uh, five times, you know, and uh, it is due to uh, investments in the energy sector. It is. It was uh, due to inviting the very major uh, companies of the world on energy sector to develop uh, with Azerbaijan uh, their national resources. And uh, I would like to say, what what is we have now? Uh, first of all, I would like to say that uh, in uh, we fully. Uh, secure our uh, energy supply and energy resources. We are now independent uh, country and we are net export country uh, in this region, on the Black Sea region. On the Black Sea region, uh, among 12 countries, you know, only Russia and Azerbaijan is net export countries. Yes. Uh, and our, and our, yeah, our countries are uh, importing countries. And it is uh, very important for Az Azerbaijan uh, because we stable now our oil production on the level of 42 million tons and it is enough for so small country like Azerbaijan enough, with but, small population. But ultimately your fortunes are changing because oil production is on a steady decline. And we'll pick up on that in just a little bit. Minister Sudirman uh, of Indonesia, you used to be, Indonesia used to be, a form, used to be an OPEC member, but now you are a net importer. What's interesting is that the recent oil route has given a tailwind for a country with a moniker of the Fragile Five, if you remember, of the taper tantrum. But now the fortunes look different. But uh, is there a certain pr threshold that'll encourage your government, force your government, to reinstate those subsidies? I think the unique position of Indonesia is, uh, yes, we are now importing fuel, but also exporting energy resources, other, which is coal. Uh, we, we, we provide uh, a large amount of coal to the world. So with the current price, I think it is uh, something that actually giving benefit for, for us because of the importing price would be down, but also the most important thing that we have already uh, reformed the way we finance the fuel, which is removing subsidies is a quite significant move, which now the market has become healthier, and, and uh, we, we are at the beginning of attracting more investment uh, uh, to uh, improve our, our uh, uh, resources in, in, in terms of oil and gas. But going forward, I think it is time to think about mixing the energy more on the a portion of renewable, because Yes, we are declining in terms of fuel, in terms of fossil, but actually Indonesia has a lot of resources in terms of uh, renewable energy. That is the new direction that we have to set up uh, for the future. We'll also get uh, uh, your perspective later on uh, in light of the outlook ahead. Indonesia is set to become a trillion dollar economy in a couple of years time. Melody, you are in the position of a global oil major uh, among the big giants who, can, who are announcing CapEx uh, declines. Uh, I know that you probably don't look at the spot market very much, but is there a certain level that'll prompt you guys to say, okay, we're gonna revise our CapEx planning plans a couple of years down the road? So thank you, Chloe, for the opportunity to be here as well. And I also want to thank uh, Minister Sadirman and our Indonesian hosts for hosting such a wonderful World Economic Forum in the region. It's an honor to be here. So 
Um, we take a long-term view of prices. We, um, our, our investments in oil and gas operations, energy development, last for decades. So we have to take a, and we do take a long-term view. Uh, we continue to believe that global demand for oil and gas will continue to grow, while existing sources of supply will inevitably decline. Uh, these commodity cycles are common in our industry. In fact, uh, the price of oil in the last 30 years has fallen five times uh, at 50%, a 50% drop five times in the last 30 years. So it's not uncommon to see this kind of uh, volatility in the industry. While there's a surplus of uh, supply right now, inevitably we believe that decline will occur. If you look at the surplus, uh, you could estimate about a two million barrel per day uh, annual surplus that exists in the market right now. But if you look at um, producing fields that will decline on average or at minimum of 3% per year, that's about a three million uh, barrel decline in, in a year uh, just with a normal decline rate. So if you look at the surplus at two million barrels and the decline, the annual decline rate, there, there is a point in time where supply and demand does come into balance. The important thing is to um, you know, continue, uh, for us the focus is to continue the projects that are under development. We have a lot of projects under development that we believe are well supported um, at the price levels and um, as project, projects will continue to move forward to completion. And like all other companies, we look hard at projects that are not yet at an investment decision or those projects that are short cycle uh, projects to make sure that they create value in the, in the, in the volatile market. So our, our view really is to look at long-term uh, supply. Right, long -term and that's demand. probably something uh, Admiral Harris agrees with. When you look at the geopolitical security, especially from an energy security perspective, you're looking at battles that are on a hundred, two year, hundred year horizon. For instance, the tensions that you see emanating from the South China Sea, a vital artery for oil and gas. Um, and China building the Great Wall of the Sand. Uh, do you think that this is going to, something that is going to disrupt the, the geopolitical landscape of much further down the road? Well, thank you, Chloe, for that question. And uh, let me also add my thanks to those of the panelists, uh, to the World Economic Forum for hosting this event and for Indonesia for hosting all of us here today. Uh, let me start off by saying that I'm the furthest thing from an energy sector expert that you're ever going to see. But I am an expert in application of military force in support of our national security interests. And we have national security interests in this region. Um, I think that, uh, that the global economy is now more interconnected than ever. And globalization fuels prosperity. But prosperity requires unfettered access. It requires freedom of navigation uh, throughout the waters of the world, and especially in this region. Uh, you don't have to read Robert Kaplan to know uh, that the center of gravity for the global economy has shifted to the Indo-Asia Pacific region. So we have our vested security interests here. Uh, as Chloe said, there are many uh, disputes in the region, and the United States doesn't take a position uh, on, those, uh, re, uh, on those disputes. But we do take a position uh, on the peaceful resolution uh, of those disputes. You know, seven of the world's 10 largest militaries are in the Indo-Asia Pacific region. So it is, we are uh, awash in a sea of uncertainty out here. And uncertainty affects uh, energy, uh, security, trade, and commerce. Uh, I think that uncertainty affects, uh, uncertainty rather creates unpredictable uh, investment opportunities and an investment uh, environment. Uh, and I think that there are um, nation states uh, in the region that are contributing to the increase in provocations and tensions that affect uh, that security and stability. And stability is good for business. Now, I'm not a business expert, but I think all the panelists here would agree that in order for business to flourish, you need to have a security environment that's stable, that allows that um, that security to flourish. So I'm in favor uh, of stability in the region, and uh, we will do our part to help uh, in place security and stability in the region.
So, Charvel, we also have something else to contend with, territorial disputes and a resource nationalism. Um, given this oversupply, depressed price environment, uh, we're also awaiting something crucial, Iran's nuclear deal. Uh, do you think it's going to sail through the finish line? If so, what is going to be the impact on the oil and gas <laughs> sector? Um, not sure whether I'm qualified to comment on that, but on, on border disputes in, in and oil fees will cut across uh, different countries. I think we've seen models here in, in Asia where this worked really well, uh, where we can have co-development of, of, of the area. Uh, Malaysia and Indonesia, Malaysia and, and Thailand, Malaysia and Brunei, where we have co-development of these areas yeah. and we share the profits and, and of, of the extraction of, and, and the, uh, the uh, process of extracting together with the host countries where we use this opportunity to develop uh, the local support and local industry uh, in extraction of the hydrocarbons itself. I think this has been a, a working formula in ASEAN especially in, um, in developing uh, hydrocarbons in, in, in disputed areas. Mm. And I think this is probably uh, a good way forward where we, we find a win-win situation uh, over the dispute and, and a lot of issues goes away. Number one, the, the political tension goes away, uh, security tension goes away, and um, we prosper together uh, in the economic value in extracting the hydrocarbons. Yeah, this is probably a really pertinent issue for Indonesia, aging uh, oil and gas fields. But then again, you talk to investors, you talk to oil and gas company executives, they say it's fiscal uncertainty in waning investment that could pose a direct challenge, especially as you try to meet this growing population of 250 million. Just comment on the price prediction. I think no one has uh, the right prediction because every prediction has been proven to be to be wrong. So uh, I think at the end of the day, it's, uh, it's about new, finding new balance between the investor, the government, and, and we, the government of Indonesia, acknowledge that. And, and that's why we really seriously to reform the regulation, reform the way we do business. We're cleaning up the kitchen. So uh, the sector is occupied by the uh, credible people, uh, credible person, so, so that we can provide leadership. And, and I think the partnership with the global community is really important, and we understand that. So, so uh, uh, it, it, is, it is challenging uh, task, but I think it's doable. And Chevron is the biggest oil producer in Indonesia. Uh, how have the challenges been? There have been long, drawn-out negotiations processes, uh, such as the one involving Mahakam. Uh, do you get the kind of conviction that uh, Chevron is going to be a long-term player in Indonesia and beyond? So we're um, delighted to be a long-term uh, partner with Indonesia in developing their resources. We've been in Indonesia for over 90 years producing oil and gas, and um, we, we're committed to the country. We have a, a very strong um, workforce. We've, we brought technologies into the country. About a 1,000 of our Indonesian employees have worked abroad in various locations, so the talent development and the, the long-term benefits have been quite good. So we've had a, a long history here. We take a, a long-term view. We believe in investing in the communities in which we operate. Uh, we're part of the communities here in Indonesia and Thailand and other countries. So we, we take a long-term view and we are you know, a strong partner in the communities in which we operate. And Minister Aliyev uh, Petronas has recently invested in Azerbaijan. Uh, your exports are more heavily focused on Europe, but as Asia is said to be the key in the driver's seat come 2035 as the biggest consumer of oil and gas, do you see a significant shift in the way Azerbaijan uh, has its uh, future outlook? Yes, right. Uh, you know, the East Asia countries is very important for Azerbaijan, and we are working on the increasing our comprehensive relations uh, on the base of mutual respect. And uh, we are, have uh, very wide uh, trading traditions. And now Azerbaijan uh, is, uh, you know, uh, on the export of oil, Indonesia is, is the number two uh, for Azerbaijan after Italy. You know, and uh, we are uh, try to uh, wide uh, our cooperation. 
Petronas, uh, like you uh, mentioned, is uh, the uh, company who participate in very huge uh, project in Azerbaijan. It is Sheikh Deniz, uh, unique world-class gas field in Azerbaijan, and they participate in uh, stage two. They have uh, share in this uh, project, 15.5%, uh, and we are uh, very um, happy to have this uh, company in, in our country. The second uh, one, we are now uh, on gas production. Azerbaijan uh, mainly um, directed uh, to east, uh, Euro, uh, to east uh, south Europe, you know, and, uh, but uh, I think uh, that in this case, we uh, will have a lot of uh, opportunities uh, to supply uh, all the uh, neighboring countries along South Gas uh, Corridor. And uh, I think that uh, in uh, future, uh, we uh, will uh, uh, more active, uh, not only in East, uh, like I said, Southeast, Europe, but in East Asia. Yeah, so as we're talking well. about, thank you, sir. So as we talk about uh, this cohesive environment, uh, but in actuality, uh, Admiral Harris, do you think that sparring interest over energy security in the future will actually create more economic uncertainty? Uh, I think there's a potential for, for that to happen, but I agree with the other panelists when we say that, you know, uh, business is, is good is good for the economy, obviously, but it's also good for security. Mm. Uh, and um, I think all of these, uh, uh, these uh, initiatives to improve the business climate in the region uh, is going to be good for security. Um, and, and I'm uh, happy to be a part of that. Well, thank you very much. And so we're talking, we're, we're in this peculiar environment. Uh, we have, we started with this excessive price weakness that led to the biggest uh, M&A in a decade. And then you also have potentially Iran coming into the market from different angles. We have different stakeholders here in the oil and gas industry. So uh, for Shariel, uh, you're upstream, but also downstream. The yeah. opening up of Iran, what does this mean? Uh, does this mean a bonanza of opportunities I, or I, competition? Well, we'll come back to the basics again. Uh, it's about supply and demand in terms of, of how investments will, will go in, 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 in oil and gas. So what, what it means is that if it does happen, then there will be increase in supply, which means prices will probably be weaker. But then again, for one problem solved in one region, there's another occurrence in another region. So it's really difficult to predict what will happen in the future around this industry. So uh, again, I, I, it is, as, as Minister said, it is impossible to, to predict. I've got to then the, throw this question to yeah. uh, Minister Aliyev. You've got this giant waking up in your doorstep. How are you going to deal with it if the sanctions are lifted? Uh, you know, I agree with my colleagues. Uh, and uh, it is uh, to uh, difficult to predict the uh, oil prices, and but in my mind, you know, we involving Iran in, in the uh, very huge oil production will be a very good signal sign uh, for economy because much more uh, as soon as uh, we produce more oil, it is. Uh, giving us more opportunity to develop all the world economy. That is why, you know, I think that uh, when uh, we speak about the supply demand, it is just only one or two factors uh, which uh, are impact on the world price of oil. But there is a lot of uh, in our factors uh, like geopolitics, you know, and you know, we in the world we have uh, very um, many uh, regions, hotspots, you know, uh, which are now uh, are in not only just conflict, but it is a big confrontation at its impact on the oil uh, prices. Like I said, uh, we. 
relation between uh, Russia and Ukraine, you know, the events on uh, Syria and uh, the Yemen, on Nigeria, uh, and Libya, and, and so on. This is the geopolitics factor. There is environmental factors because we, we need uh, more and more spend the money and invest in the uh, environmental uh, issues, you know. And uh, when, but I uh, would like to say that for uh, consumers and for production, producing countries, we, uh, it is very important to have predictable prices mm -hmm. this, because it is very important not uh, the volatility of the prices uh, it is uh, not uh, give some preferences for producing or uh, consuming uh, countries but we would like like a produ producing country we would like the predictable prices on the world so market we. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> thank you minister sudirman a resurgent Iran, is, does it spell uh, good news for Indonesia in terms of its energy needs? It's, it's depend on what perspective that you, you look uh, at, at this issue. As a importing country, I think this is good news because we have an alternative source of supply. Uh, also, the price is, is going to be good for our uh, budget. But as a producing country, uh, it is also pressure for the development of uh, oil and gas in the future, and also a pressure for the development of the uh, future energy, which is always uh, use the oil price as a cap, as the uh, benchmark. So I think uh, in short term, I think it's going to be the benefit for, for the country. Mm -hmm. And Melody, for Chevron, uh, the Iranian deal, mm -hmm. if sanctions are lifted, there are two elements. You've got oil, and there's the other element is LNG. Um, as you take a long-term view, will it still affect uh, Chevron's decision-making process for LNG? After all, you have first gas happening in Australia's Gorgon in the third quarter of this year. So again, I think we have to look at the fundamentals on supply and demand and growth, particularly in this region. If you look at the next 20 years in this region, uh, Asia will be the largest consumer of oil and gas. Uh, which will qu require a lot of um, uh, oil growth and also gas. Uh, the, the estimates that LNG needs to double in the next 20 years just, just to meet the demand growth in this region alone. So our focus is, is around um, providing, uh, trying to grow those supplies, offsetting declines that occur in natural in all fields around the world. There's inevitable declines. So in growing those um, um, oil and gas production to meet the mm. demand growth over the region over time, I mean, just the scale of the challenge to offset decline is quite significant mm. when you're trying to meet growing demand. And uh, I just think in a long-term sense, uh, projects will come to market as prices support those and um, as the demand growth um, that we, we are expecting will um, materialize. And from where you sit, uh, is, is the future as optimistic in light of the fact that you started out as a telco, became a Malaysian champion, upstream, downstream, you're everywhere. But uh, how are you going to take advantage of this Asian home base? Well, our, our business is global. Well, only um, about 50% of our business is, is in, in, in Asia right now. Well, it'll be about, again, delivering a service at most, most optimized cost. To, to, to our clients. Um, we have to look at new technologies. We have to innovate in order to readjust ourselves and find the optimum uh, price to deliver our services. There's no other way. That's the only thing that we control, can control. The, other, the, other, the price of oil will be the price of oil, and it will continue to, uh, to oscillate up and down over time. And uh, coming back to the supply again, for whatever supply that comes out of a region, it, it will readjust the price. And the readjustment of the price, again, will probably shut down some other production elsewhere. So there is a self-adjusting me mechanism for, mm -hmm. for anything that is coming out. But maybe disrupt. that was the traditional way of thinking, because I've had read fresh analysis that maybe we are under, under, underlooking, underestimating the impact of renewables. I know that a lot of the panelists here want to talk about renewables because there is a weakening link between oil and driving. Maybe it's not just about the price, it's not just about the demand and supply, 
there's something new, We're, you know, renewables. Maybe it's not just for tree huggers anymore. Melody, would you like to weigh in? So, um, you know, I think renewables are, need to be pursued where they can be pursued, um, invested in at scale without subsidies. Um, for our focus in the region has been around geothermal. Uh, here in Indonesia and in Philippines, there, there are very uh, strong geothermal resources that need to be developed. And we've been the largest developer of geothermal resources in the region between both countries. So I think there's a real opportunity in geothermal Mm. To, um, to partially enable the supply that's needed in this region. So it's a, it's a good opportunity. And Minister Sudirman, I know that you're also keen to talk about renewables. That is the direction that Indonesia is heading towards. But you've got this intermittent supply. You've got windmills and solar panels here and there. How do you get that out to the metropolis? And it's, it's about the supply and transport dynamics. How are you going to do that in this far-flung archipelago of Indonesia? Let me share the, some of the number, important number. The population of Indonesia is about 3.5% of the world. But we only have 0.2% uh, of oil reserve, only have 1.2% of the gas reserve, and only have about 3.5% of the coal reserve. Well, actually, the need, the demand will be growing and growing. But we kind of neglect the potential of the renewable energy, which is we have a lot of geothermal, like uh, Melody said. We have a lot of uh, sunshine. We have uh, hydro. We have uh, biofuel as as a tropical countries. In terms of uh, how the government, whether serious or not, uh, look at the 10 years ago when we spent 25 billion US for subsidy of uh, of a fossil fuel, and if we could spend that much, uh, the question is whether we are. Uh, willing to move forward into supporting the industry, supporting the demand, supporting the market of renewable. This is a new challenge, but yet I think Indonesia has to be seriously move forward to, to invest on the renewable. And Minister Aliyev, yeah. uh, the future of Azerbaijan, the country heavily reliant on oil and gas. Um, what would it look like if the world, in fact, turns more heavily towards renewables? Uh, you know, Azerbaijan is traditionally oil and gas a country, and we uh, develop our industry more than 150 years. That is why it is traditionally. In all economy of Azerbaijan, it's standing on the oil and gas uh, sector. And uh, we have a huge resources, uh, you know, of oil, gas. That is why we start uh, our first steps on the uh, using the renewable energy and uh, we have now the program of the developing of the renewables up to, to 2020 and we try to increase uh, you know the share of the renewables in the balance of energy supply up to 15-20 percent in nowadays we have just only 2.53 percent but we have a lot of opportunities, like uh, my colleague uh, said, we have a very uh, nice perspective for solar energy, for wind energy, because our Apsheron Peninsula is very, very windy. You know, we have the small uh, rivers and we try, now we have a lot, a, about 50 projects, you know, on the using the uh, small um, uh, hydro power stations uh, on the small rivers, uh, you know, and uh, that is why we. Uh, but it is not the uh, aim for us, you know. We uh, because we fully, like I said before, you know, we fully secured our energy supply by our own domestic and local resources. But uh, renewables uh, for us now is uh, like a future. You know, like a, a, to program uh, how we effectively and uh, economically, uh, commercially, we have uh, to use our renewables, uh, renewables energy. And Admiral Harris, uh, final question to you. Ultimately, if the world makes better use of renewables, geothermal, uh, solar, uh, wind, I know that this is not your thing, but ultimately, if countries become self-sufficient, uh, does that make your job easier? Uh, 
much further down the road. Yeah, I, I'm not sure that that's the only thing that, that complicates my daily routine. <laughs> uh, but certainly, uh, a reduction in, in uh, tension would help my job. But I, I will tell you that the U.S. Navy and, and our military system, our military system is leading the effort in, uh, uh, in, in use of alternative fuels, uh, whether it's uh, biofuels in our Great Green Fleet initiative that our Secretary of the Navy has pushed forward, uh, whether it's using uh, solar uh, and wind at some of our installations. So I'm, I'm uh, pleased with that and actually proud of the work that the Navy is doing uh, to help uh, energy conservation in the United States. Well, thank you very much for that. So what are your thoughts, really, uh, members in the audience? Do you feel that we are, uh, the renewables are going to make a difference in our future? We'd like to join, we'd like to uh, get you to get involved in our uh, conversation. I believe we have a couple of mics being passed around. So we'll start taking questions from the floor. You've been so uh, gracious and kind uh, in uh, helping me get through the sticky process uh, at the very start. Yes, yes, sir. Please introduce yourself uh, and uh, tell us your question. Next, my name is uh, Reda Teuberg of uh, South Pole Group in Switzerland. My question is to Mr. Sudirman. Indonesian government has done a re revolutionary move to remove fossil fuel subsidies at the beginning of this year. My question is, Mr. Sudirman, in case oil prices go up again, will the subsidies come back or will you keep them out of the system? Okay, uh, hang on to that, uh, Minister, we'll, because we'll take two more. We'll, to, we'll do three at a time. Yes, sir. Please introduce. Uh, yeah, there's a lady coming towards you with a mic. So the first question was what I asked. <laughs> at what price point fuel subsidies get reintroduced? Great yeah. question. <laughs> and yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question to Admiral Harris. Uh, my name is Manfred. I'm from Switzerland, too. I'm a journalist. How worried uh, are you, Admiral, about the um, empowerment of uh, the, Chinese Admiral, the Chinese naval forces because they are sooner or later are challenging the American presence there, the Pacific Fleet, I guess? And the second question, how worried are you about the tension in the South China Sea, which is a hotbed from a political and economic point of view? And, um, what are the American, I mean, what are the plans of the United States to, to, um, to keep peace, as you mentioned before, is the overall goal of the United States in that area? Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. So there were two questions. We'll first take um, uh, from uh, Minister Sudirman. Fuel subsidies, when they come back, all of a sudden oil shoots up to 70. <laughs> I mean, ultimately, isn't the mega uh, merger Thank you. predicated Th that on is, higher prices? That is a question of many people. And, and I said, and the president said that we will never retreat from the, uh, this policy because it is healthy for the market, it is healthy for the uh, energy management. Just for example, the importation of Pertamina for the last couple of months is decreased for 30 percent because the smuggling uh, issue is, is settled because there is a very tiny margin between the economic price and the uh, subsidy price. So that is one of the benefits why we, we really uh, are confident to continue. What about the price uh, if, if it's go up? I, I think uh, uh, let's pray that the price will not uh, go back to the normal time. And, and I think uh, it is our effort to, to also educate people that we are no longer rich in terms of oil and gas. We are no net importer. Uh, it's hard to do, but uh, I don't want to fool my people that uh, still thinking uh, uh, historically. Uh, we feel that uh, we are a rich country of oil and gas, but in the fact, in fact, we are importing, and uh, it's, it's, it's been since uh, uh, seven years ago uh, as an importing country. Mm. And would you also like to weigh in in light of the fact that Malaysia too got rid of its fuel subsidies, but instead there are, there is something called GST for the first time. Well. Coming, all I can comment is fuel subsidy. I echo the, um, the opinion of, of the minister. I think it's, it's uh, the, can't speak for policy, but from a practical point of view, I think excessive, uh, excessive uh, subsidy always uh, will retard industry. 
Mm -hmm. Okay, great. And uh, there were two questions for Admiral Harris. Number one, China's mili uh, growing military spending, the implications of that. Plus, how do you keep the peace in light of the fact that China is building this great wall of the sand in, uh, the, in the South China Sea? Yeah. So uh, let me begin with a question, which I, I think is an excellent question. Uh, and that is, how do I view the rise of the Chinese Navy? Uh, quite frankly, <clears throat> I welcome the rise of a strong, prosperous China uh, and by implication, the Chinese Navy uh, that adheres to the rule of law and international norms. Uh, I think we should give credit where credit is due. Uh, China has done some great work uh, in the international arena. Uh, just a quick rundown of some of those events. China was involved in the removal of chemical weapons from Syria. They are involved in the 19th iteration of their counter piracy task force uh, off the Horn of Africa. They were involved in, in helping nations uh, remove some of their citizens uh, from the unrest in Yemen most recently. They have the largest contingent of ships uh, other than Australia working off the uh, west coast of Australia for the MH370 search uh, effort uh, last year. Uh, they had uh, uh, their hospital ship participated uh, in the uh, Philippine uh, uh, hurricane uh, uh, typhoon Haiyan uh, disaster. Uh, so th that's to be commended. Uh, they sent four of their best ships to RIMPAC, the Rim of the Pacific exercise that we hosted uh, off the, uh, uh, the Hawaiian uh, coast. In fact, they had the largest contingent of ships other than United States Navy ships at that exercise. So these are positive things, and uh, they should be commended for it, and I, and I take the opportunity to do that. However, I think then, uh, to get to the second question, uh, China is responsible for the rise of tensions and provocations uh, in the South China Sea. Uh, I think you should look uh, at the 2002 ASEAN China Declaration of Conduct. If you take a look at the 2002 uh, uh, declaration uh, which China uh, agreed to do, then you look at what China is doing now in the, in, in the South China Sea uh, with their sand grab, uh, I think that you'll find that that is stark uh, in, in the changes between uh, what they agreed to do and what they are doing. So I'm concerned about that. Uh, and uh, I view that uh, 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 as, a, as, a, as a source of tensions in the South China Sea. Uh, and those tensions could, could disrupt uh, 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 stability and, uh, and by ex extrapolation, uh, prosperity. Uh, and, and those uh, disruptions could trigger uh, treaty obligations that the United States has uh, with countries in the region, uh, as well as uh, other countries uh, throughout the area. So. I'll well, thank there. you very much. Uh, we'd like to, yes, yes, I, uh, there's a, yes, we have uh, one here, two here, and three here. Yes, thank you. Yes, and four. Okay. Please let us know who you are. Hi, my name is Eti from uh, Kajamara University and Admasa University. I have three questions to anyone in the panel. Number one, what is, what is the leading country that has done research in renewable energy? If anyone knows about this, number two, are there any collaboration between government, scientists, and corporation? And number three, are there any collaboration between countries in the region or countries around the world? Or is it secretive because it will generate revenue? Thank you. Okay, uh, hope you all got that. I think there are three questions. It's all concerning uh, uh, renewables. What is being done? Is there a uh, uh, crossover platform where governments and corporate sector, public private sector effort in renewables? I think that's the theme. And we'll take another one from you. Yes. Hello. My name is Banka. I am from Surabaya, making a steel company, working for a steel company. My question is again on renewables. It is how cost effective is renewables with respect to oil at say $60, $75, and $100. Great question. Yeah, if oil keeps on getting depressed, is it worth all the effort digging underneath the ground and catching whatever wind movements that we see? Who would like to take this question? Melody, yes. Uh, I'll make a few comments. You know, I think um, to meet the glowing, uh, growing demand for energy, all forms of energy are going to be required. It's going to be oil, gas, nuclear, um, uh, coal, renewables, all, all forms will be needed to meet the growing demand. And renewables um, w will compete at some price point, but it also is so important that renewables compete at scale and without subsidy. And a lot of companies are focused on understanding how to um, 
you know, cr create renewable opportunity, energy opportunities that can compete at scale and also without subsidy. And I think that that's important. But we, we, you know, the, the view is that all forms of energy are going to be required to meet the growing demands. Minister. The latest research that I read uh, about last week, uh, in 2013, the world built new capacity of the electricity, 241 gigawatt coming from fossil, and 243 gigawatt coming from renewable, which is, they said, this is the first time the renewable past the, the fossil. And now they're spending about 50 billion uh, to do research on the solar cell, which uh, directed toward whether we can uh, create a smaller, uh, cheaper solar cell. That's, and, and it is predicted by 2050, the solar cell that now only uh, share of 1% of the electricity will be single uh, largest provider for the electricity. That is the prediction. And of course, this is very, what you call, visionary, very fut futu uh, futuristic view, but uh, I think uh, for me in Indonesia, this is uh, one of the choice, one of the option, because uh, the fact is the fossil will be gone. It's a matter of time. But the renewable resources will be always renewable. And, and what, what do we do as a government? I will test the, the willingness of the stakeholders by asking the huge budget uh, last, uh, next year, uh, 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 doubling the budget and then also uh, increase the uh, portion of renewable uh, as, as the initiative. And hopefully with the partnership between corporation and government, we will can, we'll create market, we'll, we'll create industry uh, mm. to support. And this is, uh, uh, what do you call, uh, the new direction that uh, we have to uh, take. Wow, so uh, perhaps uh, there, it, yeah, yes, yeah, I think we have a couple of hands uh, going up. Yes, sir. There's a mic coming your way. My name is Anil Bhatia, I'm from ABB. We are into renewables and power, sector, power and industry. Uh, question is to the minister, Mr. Zubilman, uh, that, uh, as you said just now that uh, the, you will push for renewables uh, through policy and so on, in, in mo many of the islands, as Indonesia has 17,000 islands, uh, renewables is already on price parity with the cost of, uh, let's say, generating uh, power through diesel power plants. So how would you push uh, this further through policy? So again, far-flung islands, Indonesia's archipelago, 7,000 islands, how do you patch together renewable energy to different households. That is even more relevant, in my opinion, because uh, the renewable is supposed to be based on the uh, local resources, right? Uh -huh. uh, there, is a, there is a sunshine everywhere in Indonesia, and then there is also water. There is a, so th that is even how more... how do you prepare for the rainy days? <laughs> of course, there is a challenge, but uh, as, as a vision, I think we have to to prepare that and, and uh, uh, talking about price, just for example. If the economy of scale already uh, come to the stage, then I think there will be more competitive price compared to the fuel. Uh, it's, it's a matter of uh, size. Of course, uh, uh, the conventional thinking always challenges whether you will be uh, able to compete with the fuel, fuel energy. Yeah, and I think really, uh, I think we've got a couple more questions, but I'll throw one and then get one, and then we'll wrap this up. Uh, to Melody, for oil majors, something like carbon capture, this is being talked about. You've got lots of uh, developments happening in pre-salt, hydrocarbon, uh, what else, Brazil in the far-flung areas. But then again, if oil prices remain depressed, is that going to uh, put those projects on hold and also carbon capture, uh, this, uh, this kind of technology, can it really be implemented on a bigger industrial scale? So um, our approach on greenhouse gas emissions, and um, you know, we're, we're investing, part of our Gorgon LNG project in Australia has a large CO2 sequestration capture program, and uh, we're investing in that. It's a very integral part of the development. Uh, it's well underway and, and certainly going to, to be able to capture and store CO2 for 
for decades to come. But our focus on greenhouse gas emissions is, is around um, being a responsible investor of natural gas and you know, developing and producing natural gas is a, um, a big, has a big contribution to greenhouse gas emissions because if nat cleaner burning natural gas is being produced to, um, for electricity, there are good emissions um, um, okay, response we'll, to that. Thank you. We'll just take one final question and then... Uh, I forget who raises that hand. Oh, I think the lady over there. Thank you. Thank you. Hagia from the Straits Times. My question is to Admiral Harris. Uh, you've talked about China raising tensions in the South China Sea. Uh, my question is, at this point, do you see a heightened risk of some kind of incident or confrontation in the South China Sea? or in the new future, or are you preparing? What kind of scenarios are you preparing for? Thank you. Um, I, I think that my job is to prepare for all scenarios from a position of strength. Uh, and my concern in the South China Sea is not major, uh, major naval force on force or major military force on force conflict. Uh, my concern is that, that there are young men and women that captain these small ships these Coast Guard ships and fishing vessels and whatever, that they're trying to do the right thing on the high seas. Uh, and their uh, activities uh, could trigger then uh, the use of, of, uh, of uh, larger ships and, and actual uh, naval forces uh, of governments that are involved in some of the disputes. Uh, and that is what concerns me. Again, I don't think that, that there's, a, uh, there's a likelihood of a major uh, force on force uh, conflict in the South China Sea today. Uh, I have to be ready for that uh, 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 from a position of strength, but I am concerned about those small uh, uh, actions, those tactical actions that have strategic consequences uh, throughout the region. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank everyone for, for taking part in this conversation with us. We're very grateful and honored to have you all with us here in Jakarta. Really appreciate it. I believe that uh, we are going to wrap up now. I'd like to thank our distinguished panelists, uh, Admiral Harris, much appreciated, and Melody Boone Meyer of Chevron, Minister Sudirman Said, and also Mid Minister uh, Aliyev, and also um, <laughs> Dato, <laughs> Tom Sri Dato Sharil. Uh, Shamsuddin, much appreciated. I'd like to give a warm, uh, a big hand of applause to everybody. Thank you very much. And you've been watching Channel News Asia's uh, forum here at the World Economic Forum on East Asia. Thank you very much again.